It's been nearly six years since a completely unknown company used the slogan, Never Settle, and their premise was simple. A good balance between some of the most powerful specs of the time at a price that would be hard to resist. The OnePlus One was such a phenomenon that the only way you could buy one was if you got an invite, and that story remained for years to follow. This was such a market disruptor that by the time the company landed its first US carrier deal in 2018, the brand was already established. People just flocked to T-Mobile stores to buy the 6T. But then came 2019 with a bit of experimentation where the company launched two OnePlus 7s in spring, but relegated the United States to only the more expensive Pro, which, regardless of its premium approach on a budget, was still quite the leap in price when compared to the more aggressive 6T. It almost feels like the swap in strategies with the 7 in the fall was a necessary return to the company's roots. For 2020, the whole regional launch plan is gone, and the strategy now is to give users a choice between a budget flagship and a more premium solution for those who want one. Meet the OnePlus 8 series. What the company meant with lead with speed, and probably the most fascinating approach the company has had yet. See, rarely have I ever made comparisons between lineups, but the differences between these phones are so substantial that I feel that the biggest question to answer is which one should you pick? I'm Jaime Rivera with Pocket Now, and this is OnePlus 8 Pro versus OnePlus 8, sponsored by Nordlocker. Stick around to learn how you can store your files securely for free. I think the most important thing to consider is that this is not the OnePlus 8 and the OnePlus 8 Plus. It's not just a play of words where this is the smaller and the larger variant of the same phone. The strategy is actually quite different, where it feels like if OnePlus is trying to serve its uh, legacy consumers, those people that are looking for a balance between price and specs with the OnePlus 8, while the OnePlus 8 Pro is that Vanguard device that's meant to compete with everything in a way that we can remove all the butts that we usually have when we do a review. Visually, you wouldn't get that impression though. If I were to stack both phones side by side, the only key differentiators are the extra camera elements because even the size differences are meager. The 8 Pro is barely 5mm taller, 2mm wider, and around half a millimeter thicker, though you will notice the added 19 grams in heft. Materials are the same with 3D Corning Gorilla Glass and aluminum, and if onyx black or glacial green are your favorite colors, it's available for both. Here we have their unique iterations, which is the ultramarine blue on the 8 Pro and interstellar glow on the 8. Visually, it's hard to look past how beautiful the compact disc glow looks on the 8, but that's until you touch it and get it dirty. The 8 Pro, on the other hand, is so matte that it's right up there with the Pixel 4 at not allowing any fingerprints or smudges to be visible. I feel both devices pay more of an homage to the Galaxy S10 and how it was boxier and lighter than its predecessors, even if neither of these devices has a headphone jack. Both have a protruding camera hump, the accents on the speaker grille are pretty much identical, and that three-way mute slider that we love is also here. Once you pop the hood, you start noticing differences. Both are powered by the same Qualcomm Snapdragon 865, but even if the RAM and storage are the same amount, the speeds are different, with the 8 Pro sporting a faster standard. The 8 Pro is also IP68, finally, while the 8 remains splash-proof with no certification. Both support Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.1, and then if we look at the battery, there is a difference with the 8 Pro having a slightly larger battery pack, but this is when things start getting interesting. See, both devices are capable of Warp Charge 30T that comes in the box, but the OnePlus 8 Pro now finally supports Warp Charge 30 wireless charging, which means that if you buy that separate accessory, you can charge this phone up to 30 watts, which is hard to find in any other wireless charging pad, or at regular speeds if you have a Xi pad, or you can even use this 8 Pro to charge another phone or accessory, as reverse wireless charging is also supported. But then the final 5G story gets interesting as both devices support sub-6 thanks to the Snapdragon X55 modem, which means you can bring it to any 5G carrier in the United States and technically each phone should work. And now we also have the great news that both T-Mobile and Verizon are carrier partners for OnePlus. But there's a tiny catch. See, both carriers are only offering the OnePlus 8 not the 8 Pro, and that pretty much means that if you want to get millimeter wave, it will only work on the Verizon variant of the OnePlus 8, 
Uh, and then if you want to get the OnePlus 8 Pro on either Amazon.com or OnePlus.com, you won't get an option for millimeter wave, at least not at the beginning. Last but not least, let's talk displays. I mean, they're both curved and look similar, but their specifications are not. The OnePlus 8 Pro naturally has a larger 6.78 inch panel versus 6.55, even if the 8 has a slightly taller aspect ratio. Both are fluid AMOLED technology with support for P3 color gamut and HDR10+, but the 8 is limited to Full HD+, versus Quad HD+, on the 8 Pro. At full resolution, the 8 only does 90Hz refresh rate versus 120Hz on the 8 Pro, along with 240Hz touch sampling. And then the 8 Pro has some extra tricks like a 10-bit display that allows HDR boost and a new MEMC chip that makes even 24 frames per second video look smoother, sort of like what you see on most high-end televisions today. And then some, and the software updates have only- And then dual firing speakers are standard on both devices and sound pretty clear. Feels that that's overkill. I'm perfectly fine with full As HD. expected, the OnePlus 8 Pro wins the hardware department, but if you notice, not by a significant margin. Now, the software story is really nothing to be compared. There really isn't much of a difference between them. They both run the same Oxygen OS 10.5.2 on top of Android 10. And uh, let me just say that if you loved Oxygen OS before, you're gonna like it even more now. For one, the most important change for me is, behold, the Google feed at the left. Like, sorry, OnePlus, I know your idea of the shelf was cool and all, but the feed is more complete, and now you don't need to have a T-Mobile variant for it. Then the company also claims lots of optimizations, but it's not like if previous iterations were sluggish in order for anyone to notice much of a difference. Second, along with the recent Oxygen OS updates to legacy devices, you can now set notifications to only show content if your face is detected. We have a new Dark Theme 2.0, which now brings its dark mode support to more applications, but notice this is a theme and not really a mode, so sadly you can't enable it with Sunrise or Sunset yet. Regardless, I do praise all the flexibility in how you can skin the user interface, with the vibrant tints being my favorite. We also have some more dynamic wallpapers for those of you looking to add more color, and you can set the color tone based on your temperature as well. In absolutely everything else, it remains as snappy as before, and that's regardless of which device you pick. Favorites like Zen Mode and Reading Mode are here, and even if you were to use either of these phones for gaming, I can't tell you that one performs better than the other by a significant margin. Now, sadly, because we all need to stay at home in these weird times, I haven't been able to test 5G on these phones. LTE works just fine, and phone calls sound just as crisp. I assume that it's the same earpiece and microphones. Thing about it is, I haven't really noticed much heating even with all the temperature we get currently in Latin America. And that really says a lot about the endurance of these phones. I feel that battery life is not really that much different. It feels like if each phone has a target of getting through the day and then some, and you have a meager difference in the battery sizes that will allow for this same target to be achieved because I've tested them separately and they both end the day just fine. Even with features like the fingerprint scanner or face to unlock, you won't really tell much of a difference. Now, regardless of which device you pick, one of my favorite applications is NordVPN. It's always great to match these fast LTE speeds with the power of a VPN for you to encrypt your connection for private browsing, or in addition, for you to be able to access content that's probably blocked in your area. But what if you also wanted to encrypt your files securely in your computer? For that, the creators of NordVPN have today sponsored NordLocker. NordLocker helps you control your security and privacy and your data safe wherever you decide to go. It helps you protect sensitive information like finances, IDs, password photos, videos, notes, etc. It's simple to download the app for your Mac or Windows, offers fast setup and login, and the experience is user-friendly, where literally all you do is easily drag and drop your files to the app for super fast encryption of files of any size. You can then share encrypted files via email, messaging applications, airdrop, file transfer services, or upload them to the cloud. There's also multi-device access, and the app works nicely with the most popular cloud services like Dropbox, Google Drive, you name it. Best of all, there's 24-7 tech support. Use the link in the description below, which has coupon code POCKETNOW to get NordLocker free for up to two gigabytes. And if you wanna go unlimited, that's about the price of two cappuccinos a year, and there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. 
Really, the tiebreaker is the camera, and this is where I'm gonna say that I'm a bit shocked. I really wasn't expecting there to be much of a difference, but I was wrong. The variations between them are significant, and it starts with the spec sheet. Both phones have a 48 megapixel primary camera, but the micron size is dramatically different, allowing the 8 Pro to suck in more light while pixel binning. Then the 8 Pro brings another 48 megapixel camera for the ultra wide, which reportedly matches close to the primary on the 8, while the latter has a 16 megapixel shooter. And then the 8 Pro offers an 8 megapixel telephoto, which the 8 lacks in favor of a digital crop from the primary sensor. The fourth camera on the 8 Pro is a color filter sensor, while the 8's third lens is a 2 megapixel macro, which the 8 Pro achieves through a built in motor. Both have face detection autofocus, while only the 8 Pro includes laser assistance, and both devices then have identical 16 megapixel selfie cameras. Now, during the day, you won't be able to tell much of a difference. You'll probably notice a slight improvement in dynamic range on the 8 Pro, but that's pretty much nitpicking. Colors are not necessarily uniform across focal lengths, but I do value the versatility of different ways to capture the same shot. The 8 Pro has the advantage of producing fairly usable photos up to 10x zoom, and with a 30x limit for stalker unusable photos. V8, on the other hand, goes as far as 10x, though those pictures are useless, even if I do prefer its default 2x zoom from a digital crop versus the 3x on the 8 Pro. I'm also gonna say that the 8 Pro can produce far more reliable macro photos, where I really don't know what OnePlus is doing with this 2 megapixel shooter on the 8. Low light is where things get interesting. For those complaining about how bad OnePlus phones were in the past, well, the 8 Pro should be your phone while the 8 is better than last year's phones, but not by much. The 8 Pro, for example, is able to pull in a significant amount more light and less grain from the ultra wide, while the 8 favors a darker photo that more depicts what the eye is seeing at the moment, but it's probably just a strategy to reduce the grain. I'm not saying it's bad, but I really don't see any difference or benefit over just using the ultra wide without Nightscape. Portraits now have the advantage of supporting a wider and tighter crop, with the latter providing a more natural result. I actually feel the 8 Pro produces portraits that look just too fake, while the 8 gives you shots that are a bit more true to life. And then selfies on the other hand are identical since the hardware is the same, meaning they're good enough even if they do struggle with borders when it comes to portraits. And then as for video, the 8 Pro just wins. I mean, capabilities are the same, and both devices include a Cine aspect ratio, but the 8 Pro provides far more detail and less warping as you walk, even if stabilization is comparable. I like that you can now switch focal lengths while filming, something that its predecessors could not do, but even here the 8 Pro handles color and detail far better, along with stabilization, while the 8 tries but really does not deliver. My only bummer situation, even with the 8 Pro, is selfie video, which should not remain 1080p in 2020. This phone has enough megapixels, and it's been two years since this feature reached the market on other competing devices. Obviously, the 8 provides the same results, but that's acceptable for a device that doesn't claim to be for the pros. To conclude, let's round up the numbers. The OnePlus 8 Pro owns the hardware, I mean, it was meant to. And then the software experience is pretty much a tie, there's no surprise there. I really can't tell much of a difference in the experience of using both phones, and really the only tiebreaker left is the camera. It's as if the message that OnePlus is sending to consumers is that if you want the legacy OnePlus experience where the camera is just good enough, then you should stick to the OnePlus 8. Now, if you actually want a OnePlus device with a camera that's comparable to other flagships, you'll need to grab the OnePlus 8 Pro, even if this device isn't necessarily pressing all the buttons that matter to us yet. Probably a couple of software updates could fix that. The last piece of the puzzle is the price, and the OnePlus 8 starts at $699, the OnePlus 8 Pro starts at $899, and if it were up to me, my choice would be the complete opposite from last year, as I prefer the 7T over the 7T Pro because both phones look different, but they perform pretty much the same, where this year the differences are substantial. I do feel that I'm getting $200 more of a phone with the OnePlus 8 Pro with the camera enhancements alone. I feel that the OnePlus 8 Pro 
is actually the better buy. Let us know which one would you pick in the comments down below. And while you're at it, follow us on social media and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this one. Also follow me on my personal handles to see me review phones while being at home, as that's the responsible thing to do. Please give this video a thumbs up if you like what you saw. I'm Jaime Rivera. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you on the next one.